Hello everyone and welcome to another Kerbal Space Program video in which things are actually fairly topical for once. <laughs> Some of you may be aware that NASA successfully landed its InSight probe on the surface of Mars this week and so to celebrate I'm going to send my own robotic lander to the surface of Juna which is obviously the analogue for Mars in Kerbal Space Program as I'm sure you're aware. It does share a few basic similarities with the NASA counterpart but it has its own little Kerbal features such as the gigantic Science Junior unit. I did try and make it at least somewhat reminiscent of the actual InSight lander though but regardless I'm aware that as far as my usual missions go this is pretty uninteresting but I wanted to take the opportunity to discuss something I've never really touched upon too much in this channel and that is uh, showing how I play the game behind the curtain of a video. You see because the subject matter of this video is fairly lightweight I ended up only doing about I ended up with only about 15 minutes of raw footage uh, with regard to my captured video so you know while the time lapse and stuff can still be sped up like you're seeing here as I construct the Atlas V shoddy replica and now we can quickly go to the traffic station and wait for a Juna encounter window uh, but yeah, yeah, whilst I can tell us all of this, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second there. Um, I, would, I thought it'd be a good idea to perhaps show off the rest of the mission completely untouched, like with bloopers and outtakes all included. So I start off with my standard panning around shot. I uh, throttled down the engine and toggled the first act stage and then forgot I did that and then toggled the next stage and uh, I ended up losing. <laughs> so that's blooper number one. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's like I say. I thought it might be a good idea to perhaps show off the rest of the mission because of like this, just so you can kind of see what goes on outside the um, outside the standard experience that you might be used to. I did check on Twitter. I did like a poll to see if this was something people might be interested in, and I got a pretty positive response to that. And uh, further to th further to this, uh, this mission is actually a kind of soft, sort of soft recreation of my very first interplanetary mission I ever flew in KSP, which would have been. I don't know, sometime way back in 2014. I found it to be a much taller order back there. It took, it took a, a lot longer than it did in this video. Plus, you know, in this video, I was actually trying to complete the mission as fast as possible as the original plan for this week was to release an SSTO video. However, I have been having some troubles getting that mission to work correctly. So I think I'm going to have to probably scrap the uh, some five hours of footage I recorded for it and start over. It, as depressing as that sounds. It is currently Thursday night and this is literally the last evening I have free to work on a KSP video as tomorrow night I'm at a work Christmas party and this is all you know very last minute because again the original plan was an entirely different mission so I haven't got much time to get this video recorded rendered and all that so hopefully it's uh, serviceable as your um, weekly dose of KSP content from this channel uh, but I digress. As I mentioned, this is a somewhat soft recreation of my first interplanetary mission, which consisted of sending an unmanned robot lander to the surface of Juna on a one-way trip to gather some science. It is something, uh, and I have covered this in my Laun Aerospace mission, in which we did a, uh, in my Laun Aerospace series, I should say, in which we did an EVE mission, but it was a one-way trip with a rover. It is something I'd recommend to do with most people when attempting to go in interplanetary for the first time because for me at least uh, the hardest part was getting from Kerbin to the sphere of influence of another planet so eliminating the stress that comes with needing to return home makes things a lot easier to accomplish the goals. Plus you know it's a little bit more in keeping with how actual space programs work wherein you would definitely send some kind of robotic scout mission ahead of any actual astronauts. At least those are my two cents about what most uh, what most space missions should probably be uh, designed around. So why are people so excited about NASA InSight landing anyway? Because it doesn't seem that impressive on the surface, especially, you know, it, it really doesn't have the uh, the wow factor of Curiosity or Matt Damon. So, you know, people might be thinking, what's the big deal? But I would say it's very cool nonetheless. And not just because Mars is a very cold place. <laughs> because first and foremost, it actually survived the landing. Most Mars, Mars landings are actually unsuccessful. I think the success rate is only like 40% for Mars landers. This is off the top of my head. And I think I got this from some uh, citation required source. <laughs> um, you know, a good example of an unsuccessful landing would be last year's Exo Mars lander. I guess Endo Mars would be a better... It would, it would probably be a bit better name for it posthumously. <laughs> And what, uh, well, the irony in that uh, failed landing was the fact that the uh, the lander itself was designed to test uh, new key technologies to safely deliver a 2020 rover mission. So 
I'd say those new technologies might need some ironing out, but hey, what do I know? <laughs> uh, the big feature of the Insight, though, which going back to the original topic here, uh, is the is the big drill on board, which you may have seen in all the photos of it. And this drill will unsurprisingly, uh, unsurprisingly, will unsurprisingly drill into the surface of the Red Planet, and uh, a good five or so meters down to help paint a picture of the subterranean environment, giving us information regarding the core activity of the planet tectonic behaviours and history, and whether or not it's warm enough down there for liquid water and possibly even alien life to exist below the surface. And it will do this by measuring temperatures and seismic activity. In fact, and some people might not know this, uh, that's how the lander derives its name. InSight actually stands for something. It stands for Interior Exploration Using Seismic Investigations, Geodesy and Heat Transport. So. These are certainly exciting times. Another reason to get excited, actually, is that uh, about any Mars landing, actually, is the uh, the monstrous difficulty in landing things there. Because, well, because of the delay in getting signals between Earth and Mars, it's not actually possible, realistically, to control a landing with a human. Therefore, the entire sequence has to be fully computer controlled and automated. So. This makes things a lot harder, coupled with the fact that the atmosphere itself is incredibly tenuous. You know, it, it, I think it's like less than 1% of Earth's. So that's cool, though I will concede that Curiosity's sky crane deployment was was pretty spectacular too. However, the technology on the InSight lander is nothing, I sell you nothing, <laughs> compared to the might of Laon Aerospace's IH Neufav lander, which stands for I had no other ideas for a video. <laughs> we, we not only have seismic and temperature readers, but a plethora of other scientific and surface sample analyzers to give us lots of information about this, this strange and rusty world that we find ourselves hurtling towards. As we deploy the fairings and expose the uh, the lander to, I guess, to the viewers at home, you guys. <laughs> uh, and all we need to do now is coast our way along to Juna. We'll need to perform a course correction halfway through in order to ensure that our orbital line passes through the atmosphere so that we can slow down using aero braking. We do have enough delta V to not have to worry about doing this, but you know, I'm just thinking of maybe this would be a good t thing to try and replicate yourselves at home. And so there's lots of excess fuel so in case you make kind of errors or you don't get quite as accurate uh, an encounter that I did. Well, I, I, I well, I should probably rewind. I say we should make a mid-course correction, but as you, you may remember earlier, I did say I was rushing this because I don't have very much time to get this whole thing filmed and edited and uploaded. And I, I forgot. Actually, I think I was maybe writing the tweet about whether or not people wanted to see this as one continuous edit rather than just a standard video. And then I forgot that I hadn't done that yet. So I was like, oh, my periapsis is nowhere near where I want it to be. So I decided to uh, burn radial in with the big skipper engine to get a rough periapsis height. And uh, I ended up actually on a collision course with the surface of the planet, which is a bit too low. It would be entering the atmosphere way too aggressively. So then I thought I'd do some... Uh, fine-tune burning using shift and control to do more precise burns and I realized that we had no probe control and uh, my com net can't reach it because I'm, I'm not playing on my normal save file so I was like oh well I, it's gonna be very hard for me to do precise burns with the skipper when I'm only able to use either 100% or 0% thrust so let's just decouple the lower stage and use the uh, much less powerful and therefore far more easy to control precisely engine on the lander which is a spark engine and then, I don't know, I think I just forgot and I just started time warping towards the planet and I was like, oh, oh yeah, that's right, I didn't adjust my periapsis. But I only realised after the fact, we're about to get to blooper number two, I am kind of spoiling the video ahead, so sorry about that, but I feel like it's going to be pretty obvious pretty quickly as the temperature gauges start flashing up on screen rather alarmingly quickly. But hey, you know what? We are still in November. Actually, are we? For you guys? I don't think we are. I think we're on December. But for me, it's November, which is firework month in the UK. So I guess it's kind of nice that you get some fireworks in this video. Uh, but yeah, let's not bother. Let's just, uh, let's just reload. Luckily, I made a quick save before I deployed this lander. But let's just uh, enjoy the show whilst we're here, see how much survived. And then maybe we can just sort of skip ahead a bit and get to the actual... Uh, we'll reload that quick save and go from there. So here we are, back. It's a bit of a sense of deja vu. We're gonna, this time, burn radial out. And uh, then I remembered that we have this antenna here, actually. I'd forgotten about that because I was using it as a, like a cosmetic feature to make this look like a more legit lander. But then I thought, why not we just put this satellite dish to use and then we can stay in contact with the tracking station and, uh, you know, get some better control. So this was not a, it was, a, 
Let's just ignore my incompetence and move on to a different topic. But there you can see, actually, there's the big drill. And I thought, now we've uh, got clear of it, we've got a better periapsis, let's do another custom quick save in case I mess up again somehow. But, you know, with the uh, the thinness of Juno's atmosphere, 17, well, I guess it's more, it's more or less 18 kilometers, isn't it, that periapsis, we should be very, very safe. It, it, it's pretty hard to explode from overheating in Juno's atmosphere because it's so, so thin. And there we get some nice fireworks. So this is not a very realistic recreation of uh, the inside mission at this point, which entered using like a heat shield and like a UFO shaped capsule around it. But this is Kerbal Space Program and this is the Kerbal way to expose all of your very delicate and expensive equipment to super hot plasma. So uh, yeah, look at that. Look at that for liquid fuel in Delta V. We've got 704 meters per second to land and we have an abundance of parachutes. So again, definitely, definitely overkill. But whatever, overkill is sometimes nice, and you know, we don't got that many. The fuel tanks I really were using is just sort of a structural attachment point for the uh, the solar panels. It's not like this thing actually needed that much that much liquid fuel, but those fuel tanks do make a good central point for peripheral solar panels. And the solar panels are arranged like that just because that's the closest kind of shape I could make that would make this look like Insight's general shape, as in it has big circular solar panels. Obviously, circular solar panels aren't a thing in stock KSP. So this is the next best thing. Lots of linear solar panels around a central uh, rounded point. Anyway, we deployed the drogue chutes earlier on to get some slowdown initially, and then we could deploy the biggest parachutes once we were in the thicker parts of the atmosphere, which admittedly are still quite thin, to get as much slowdown as possible, and we are going very, very slowly, less than 10 meters per second. So this could almost probably touch down without the engine. We, will, we do still need the engine, but in fact, we could probably speed up this bit of the footage, actually, because this is quite slow pace now. But I'm, I'm sure you can get the idea of what this might look like in real time. And we can quickly end the, uh, the time lapse as we finish off our touchdown using some quick burns with our engine to slow ourselves down enough safely. Boinged up a little bit, but other than that, a fairly uneventful landing. And there's a little pan around cinematic shot of the lander itself. We can extend both our antenna. Uh, again, there was another satellite dish I forgot I had <laughs> when it came to uh, controlling this thing without probe control. Uh, there we go. I guess we should probably deploy the solar panels at this point, although we have been surviving up until this point using an RTG clipped inside. So these panels aren't even required for the for the actual uh, lander in terms of Kerbal Space Program, but uh, uh, they're more there. They're more there for the, for the aesthetics, as is all of the science kit on this thing, because we are in a sandbox save again. Because I was truly, tr I was really rushing to get this thing done. But I, was ho I hope, I hope it was a fairly enjoyable video nonetheless. It's kind of a more relaxed pace, and I suppose you can kind of see because I know I don't know if people might see my videos and get disheartened because I'm doing things so fast. This is just to show that they're not quite as fast paced or competent <laughs> as you might otherwise think. They are, you know, still quite slow paced if it was played at normal speed, but. I like speeding them up just to make things a little bit more, a little bit more snappy, a little bit more kind of to the point. But there you go, there's some shots of the lander. I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, normal, normal kind of style next week. Hopefully I'll have, I'll have that SSTO ready. Otherwise I'll have a bit more time to prepare something else in lieu of that. But yeah, like I say, hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed the InSight landing as well. And uh, yeah, I'll put some links on screen to some videos. The one on the left can be selected for you by YouTube's algorithm and the one on the right is just my most recent upload. Then obviously you've got your Patreon and your subscription links, Discord and Twitter in the description. Have a good week guys. Goodbye.